loves, welcome back. I am going to be doing my top 2020 books for you today, which I know is kind of late, <laughs> but better late than never. Um, yes, it's just taken me ages to get my brain back in gear after Christmas and this sort of video does require a little bit of um, thought. Uh, I actually didn't film a top books of 2019 video, I just did a blog post, but I thought this year, seeing as we've done so much book content um, through the course of 2020 because there was not a lot else going on, um, I thought it'd be nice to do an actual video this year. If you're wondering where on earth are you, <laughs> I am actually at the farm and I'm in a bit of the farm that you have never seen before, I don't think. Um, so yeah, so we came out to the farm weeks and weeks and weeks ago. We came out for Christmas quite a lot earlier than we usually would. Then a lot of Christmas chaos happened here in England, in the UK, and then there was changes in tears and now we're in a national lockdown. So we've been here for much longer than we anticipated and will be here for the foreseeable future. I'm actually not supposed to be wearing this shirt in this video um, because then I'm double shirting, but <laughs> it's kind of chilly in here. So um, if I put it back on, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, but yes, yeah, so we obviously are staying at home and being safe here at the farm. And basically as soon as we arrived, my social media brain just shut down. <laughs> I think it had been a really heavy year and I just haven't posted much at all. So that's why you haven't seen me here. <laughs> but yeah, so Zach and I have been staying in Library Barn, um, which has been sort of undergoing works for quite some time. And it's sort of near finishing, it's not completely done. But um, yes, we've been sort of spending Christmas in here, which is nice. Um, it's the same address and we're the same household as we were before, it's just, literally a separate building so it's nice to have our own space we are still very much a household with the rest of my family and yes i'll show you a little bit more of library barn in the vlogs maybe if you're wondering where all these wonderful books have come from this is actually my aunt's um library which my mum and i decamped to here when she passed away um which is lovely we get to keep her library intact library barn gets to keep its name it was a library before it was all renovated and yes it gets to stay a library um, for all my aunt's books so you can have a little look at what she's got back there she's got quite um, an extensive collection of books of all different genres she's got a lot of reference books I think directly behind me are all of her embroidery books there's so many <laughs> embroidery books but yeah you can have a little um, peak I don't know whether you will see but that's why it makes this setting so perfect for this video um only problem is or one of the problems is there's not a lot of um natural light in here especially because it's winter time and especially directly here in front of the books it's more of a cozy setup so I don't know how the lighting is going to be um in this video and as I've said before this camera does not perform amazingly well um in low light so we'll see how we get on. There's other bits of the barn which have better light, but I wanted to film in front of the books today for obvious reasons. Also, if you see me on Instagram and I'm posting pictures from London, that's because there's a huge delay with Zach and my pictures because we um, have been taking pretty much everything that I post on Instagram on film. And film is expensive and precious, so it takes us sometimes a little while to fill it fill a roll up we wait till we have a few rolls then we send them all off together then there was a delay of christmas so i do have some sort of december london um pictures and yes yeah, so if you see on my grid it sort of looks like i'm back and forth between london and the farm that is not the case it's just um yes my delayed film pictures coming to you in a sort of random order. It does also mean that um, on my grid I look a lot less <laughs> pregnant than I am as we sort of move forward. Um, so I'll do a little bump shot because it's been a little while. I know I'm doing a bit of an update here at the beginning of my top 2020 books. Yes, we are looking much more pregnant these days. Um, <laughs> I'm in my third trimester. But yes, yeah, so you can expect some farm vlogs probably over the next few weeks. I'm not sure how long this lockdown will last. We have been going on walks 
and that's basically it <laughs> but it's nice to have a bit of a change and I feel very lucky that we could be here for Christmas and that we get to stay at home here um yes feeling very lucky um and hope you're all doing well and that you are healthy um yes it's pretty dark times here in the UK at the minute so yeah but anyway my loves um I didn't know when I was going to film this video and I thought I might film it between Christmas and New Year which was wishful thinking but it does mean that I brought out most of my books so we don't have to do a boring video where I just sort of stare at the camera and tell you about the books I have got books to show you all of which you've seen before there are some things that I do have a lot of I don't have a lot of clothes so you will not be seeing a lot of fashion um, content from me over the next few weeks I'm also fitting into less and less stuff and I'm so reluctant to buy new stuff um, because baby's arrival is imminent and yes, I'm living in the same clothes a lot. But again, not really a pressing issue. Uh, anyway, now we've done a little update, I will start talking to you about my top 2020 books. Actually, I did want to have, sorry you guys, I did want to have a little reflection on my reading year because I had some thoughts. Um, but yes, as I'm sure you will have noticed, there are timestamps down below if you want to just skip straight to the books. But yes, yeah, so 2020, I read 120 books. Um, I wanted to read 125, so it's a, a tiny bit annoying on the old Goodreads reading challenge. I was like, dang it. Um, I was five books short. I had a pretty slow reading month in December and in general have just been distracted by many other things that have been going on and have not been reading that much. And I think... Uh, that's happened to me periodically throughout 2020 so I didn't end up reading as much as I wanted to um, but because I'd had such a productive reading time earlier in the year um, we were sort of okay still managed to make it 220 books which is pretty good I'm not I'm not that annoyed about it really and yes so when I initially thought back over my reading year I did sort of feel like it could have been a lot better which sounds kind of negative <laughs> um, I don't know I think partially because this year was so difficult in so many ways and probably yeah inhibited my enjoyment of um, books I was reading at certain times so I think it's definitely um, sort of yeah tainted by all of that my thoughts about my reading year so perhaps inevitably um, after I had a year of buying no books in 2019 and I read mostly backlist titles to my memory um, that I had already had on my shelves, some I'd had on there for a long time, some I had bought sort of semi-recently in 2018, but yeah, not new releases. Um, I went a bit crazy this year on the new releases, the trendy books, the books I was seeing on Bookstagram and Booktube and looking back, I wish I had placed a bit more emphasis on backlist titles that I sort of thought I would get on better with. That's something I'll definitely be taking into 2021 with me. I think it's really easy to do, but yes, I've learnt my lesson. I feel like I definitely want to be a bit more wary of new releases this year in favour of books. I think I'll just have a better time with because I'm always honing that ability to sort of read blurbs and read reviews, both positive and negative to try and work out whether a book's for me. I hope to do a bit more of that this year because um, my goals for 2021 are actually to read less. And that's not just because there's a baby on her way, but that is also a very good reason to um, set a much lower goal this year uh, because I highly doubt I'm gonna have the concentration uh, or the time to be reading endless books. But even if she weren't on her way, um, I would be sort of aiming for fewer books this year because I really want to go for quality over quantity and I also tend to really enjoy longer books um, which obviously just require more time so I want to give myself room for that. I'm aiming for 50 this year, don't even know if I will make it to 50 because that seems like a 
tall order with a baby on the way <laughs> in March, which is quite early on in the year. Um, but we'll see how we go. And I've been enjoying it. I've been reading at a much slower pace over the past couple of weeks and just allowing myself to read when I actually really want to. I've still been quite distracted by various things. I feel like baby's impending arrival and trying to get things organized for her arrival is, um, you know, taking up a lot of my brain. So uh, yeah, but I've been enjoying just reading slower, allowing myself to not, you know, worry about it and not race through books and just enjoy them. Those are my goals for the new year. Let me know what your goals are, your reading goals are, if you have any. You don't have to set reading goals. I like it because it does encourage me to read. Um, but like I said, a sort of slower pace of reading is definitely gonna suit me better this year. Um, also, any mums or new mums, if you're readers and you love reading, let me know if you have any tips to read more. Because obviously I don't want to lose one of my favorite things to do. Um, as a new mum, I, I mean, I doubt I'm gonna get my reading done in those literal first few weeks or anything like that. I'm not thinking I'm gonna pick up a book at all, but I thought one way I might try is to start reading on my phone a little bit more, just so it's always to hand. So if I am sort of breastfeeding or whatever, and I find myself mindlessly scrolling Instagram or something, I could read instead. I think that might be a way of making sure I read a bit more, but let me know if you have any tips anyway. Like I said though, I'm not super worried about it. I just don't want to lose it completely, if you know what I mean, because it does bring me joy. That is the whole point. Um, but anyway, I've been rambling on for 21 minutes, hopefully much less time for you guys. Um, and we really need to get started and get cracking in my top 2020 books. So, so in my blog post last year and this year, I sort of had various categories. This one is called the best of the best. Um, they're ones that I find really memorable. Like whenever someone asks you, what would you recommend I read? These are the books that always pop into my brain. And there's only ever a few every year, like really not very many at all. Um, last year it was In the Distance by Hernan Diaz and um, The Greenlanders by Jane Smiley. Those are my absolute faves. Those are the ones I think about all the time that I still, you know, want to recommend to people. You will know that because it was in my wintry books video, I think. So these are my best of the best of this year. And actually I said in my blog post, and I will say now, um, even though I had quite a negative sort of sense of my reading year, um, Actually, when I went to put the blog post together, I realized how many good books I did actually read. And I have lots to talk about. So this category is gonna have no surprises, I don't think, because I talk about these books all the time. Um, first up is the Cromwell Trilogy by um, Hilary Mantel. My aunt also actually loved these books and she's got the hardbacks here. Um, she's got a hardback wolf hall and a hardback bring up the bodies here. I have only got my copy of Wolf Hall with me for space reasons. Um, but anyway, I loved, loved, loved this trilogy. I'm going to be a bit more reflective in this video rather than doing actual proper reviews. Also because we've got lots of books to talk about, so I do kind of want to speed through them a little bit so this video isn't super, super long. I will link my blog post up down below and you can click through on there to my original reviews. So the Cromwell trilogy, I talked about this so much recently, I really don't want to bore you all to tears, so I don't want to talk about it too much more. But these are historical novels that follow Thomas Cromwell, a bit of a shady figure, a bit of an unknown figure, um, who was a commoner who ended up becoming one of Henry VIII's most trusted advisors, at least for a time, and became a very powerful man, basically. Hilary Mantel brings him and Tudor England to life in these novels. They are so excellent. I love the writing. I love the atmosphere. I find the history interesting. It's just a combination of so many wonderful things for me, and I would highly recommend them. They are a little bit tricky to sort of get the style of, particularly Wolf Hall, but I think it's worth a try. Um, you can have a look at my original review, see kind of what I said about them then, um, and a few little tips for reading them. I'm gonna try and make my way through a fair amount of Mantel, I think, this year. She's one of the authors I'd like to read more of her sort of backlisted titles. 
that's something I kind of want to do this year is read read more books by authors I already know that I like. First book I read this year was a Mantel, um, which is one Zach got me for Christmas. It was it was good. It was a bit of a mixed bag, um, which we'll talk about. But yes, anyway, that's something I want to do this year. So that is in my best of the best. I've got these piles just like completely disorganised. Not organised at all, but anyway. Another trilogy that will come as absolutely no shock to anyone is... The Southern Reach Trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, again, I've only got the first one here, which is Annihilation, but we've also got Authority and Acceptance. You all know I've been working my way through Jeff Vandermeer's work over the past year and will continue to do so this year, I'm sure. Um, I loved these. So I read City of Saints and Mad Men in 2019 and really enjoyed it. Did make its way into my top books of 2019. But when I read this in February, I just loved it. The books are quite different. Um, I don't know if you remember me saying at the time. Anyway, I watched the movie first, enjoyed it. It's quite different from the book, but it sort of has, it does have a vibe <laughs> that sort of suits the book and would give you an idea whether you might like the book as well. So this first book is a very taut, um, focused thriller, I would say. Um, it's a first person narrative from the diary of a woman called the Biolo Biologist. She doesn't have a name. Three other women enter Area X, the mysterious Area X, which seems to be some sort of pristine wilderness that surrounds an old lighthouse and then it also has this weird border to it. Basically, missions keep being sent into Area X to figure out what it is what is happening, why is it different to um, the surrounding area, why is it such a wilderness when it used to be a normal populated area. And as soon as they get in there, they're unable to communicate with the outside world and the missions basically go missing. It's very creepy, it's very unsettling, it's very weird, um, it's very imaginative, inventive and one of the best things about all three books is that they're so clever. Um, there's so many ideas going on in here. Ideas about human and non-human life, ideas about our inability to be objective, lots of sciencey elements, some weird fantasy elements as well. There's just so much going on in here, lots of ideas about borderlands, about wilderness. Really, really clever, but really, um, especially this first book, very sort of readable and thrillery. And that continues throughout the trilogy. The second two books tend to be a little bit less popular. Um, I will let you go and read my re original reviews if you're interested in that because I could talk about them all day. But I just love them. Next we have a non-fiction which is Meeting the Universe Halfway by Karen Barad. This is a book which combines quantum physics. Barad is a quantum physicist by sort of nature. That's what she studied, teaches. Um, and it combines that with... Uh, philosophy, feminist theory, cultural theory in general um, to create this really persuasive view of the world and like I said at the time when I read this I used parts of this and other articles by Barad for my master's dissertation and I had always wanted to read the whole thing and it really is absolutely excellent. It's one of the most persuasive bits of theory I've ever read because it really combines those science elements with the um, social and cultural theory to, yes, create a convincing portrait of the world that I think about all the time. I apply to all sorts of things in my life. It's become part of me now and it's really interesting. It was also interesting to just learn some quantum physics um, I think Barad does a really excellent job of explaining it for those of us who aren't scientists. Um, and I think she also does a pretty good job of explaining the social and cultural theory to, um, from a science perspective, if you come to this book from a science perspective. I loved it. It pairs so nicely with um, the Southern Reach trilogy particularly. And it's just excellent in every way. Um, it's very complex. But it is quite readable. It's not full of jargon like a lot of um, cultural theory is, which it is a bit of a pet peeve of mine, is how difficult and inaccessible some of it is. Sometimes that's the point. I loved it. One of those sort of life-changing books. I need to remember this book. If I ever am asked the question, you know, 
what books have changed your life. This is one of them. Next, in my best of the best category, we have The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beattie. This book broke my brain. <laughs> Paul Beattie's um, prose is like no one else's I've ever read. It is dazzling, I think is the adjective that's often used for Beattie. Um, it's really, I couldn't even fathom how, where you begin to write something like this or to write like BT does. It's an excellent, this is his debut. I have read The Sellout before, but I want to reread it because I don't think I fully absorbed it at the time. I'm a bit more of a mature reader now, so um, and I read that back in 2016, I think. It was heartbreaking, it was dazzling, like I said, um, and it sort of, BT has a no holds barred approach to literature, which I love. It's about a, this says, a teenage surf bum forced to wise up when his mother moves from suburban Santa Monica to urban West Los Angeles. Um, and she moves them because she thinks that her son doesn't have a strong connection to his racial identity as a young black boy. Um, and so that's already setting up all sorts of assumptions and stuff. And yes, anyway, this was a book that stopped me rating books like out of five. I was just like, I have no idea what I, what I would rate this book. And I think it's just impossible to keep doing ratings. But yes, I encourage you to um, have a look at reviews of this one or read my original review of this one for a bit more information on it because it's quite a complex book, but I would highly recommend it and I will not forget it anytime soon. And P BT is another author I want to read more of this year. Now this book was a lovely surprise, new author for me. It's Lent by Joe Walton. It is about Girolamo Savonarola, don't know if I'm saying that right, definitely I'm not, who was a monk in 15th century Florence. Real historical figure. This is a historical fantasy, I would say. Um, it's quite subtle and having now read another of Walton's books, I feel like it's quite a Walton sort of fantasy which is like coming at it sort of in a skewed way. He was a real monk and he at one time sort of held Florence under his sway. Things didn't quite end up good for him. <laughs> I don't think that's spoiling anything. It happened many years ago. Um, and I picked this book up because I loved Wolf Hall so much and I just had a newfound interest in historical fiction. So anyway, he was renowned at the time for prophesying. Basically, Walton gives him in the in this book all those powers uh which is really interesting and there's just so much to love about this there's a few surprises inside the book the prose is kind of pared back and simple there's nothing um it's not sort of difficult in the way that wolf hall is sometimes um this is very much very readable and also really like enjoyable i know that it sounds <laughs> maybe a bit suspicious 15th century monk doesn't sound like your kind of thing I really suggest you try it and read the first few pages or something because um, I think it would appeal to a lot more people than have actually ended up reading it. A lot of you have all said that you tried it after I recommended it and you also really liked it. So give it a go, even if it kind of sounds a bit like, really? <laughs> because I think it's a fantastic piece of work. I'm gonna read more Walton this year as well even though I didn't particularly love Among Others. I liked it, but I didn't love it. Okay, my next category is still the best of the best, but for other reasons. For whatever reason, it didn't, they don't quite make it into the top category for me. They don't quite spring to mind whenever someone says, recommend me some books, or what were your favorite books this year? But when I look at um, what I've read this year, these were still some of my absolute favorite books and um, I need to remember to recommend them. Um, anyway, starting with David Copperfield, which I read way back in January 2020. Um, loved this. I wasn't really sure what to expect because I've read a lot of Dickens as a teenager and really, really loved him, but um, I didn't know whether I would enjoy his writing quite so much anymore. I read this because the film was coming out and I wanted to watch the film, but I wanted to read the book first. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, made me laugh out loud. A wonderful cast of characters, eccentric characters. It's a good story. It follows David Copperfield. It's a first person narrative. So it's gonna 
draw you in. And he goes through all sorts of things in this book, some of which are semi-autobiographical. Dickens himself said that this was one of his favourite of his own books, I think because it does have that semi-autobiographical element. I recommended this to my mum. and She was not a big Dickens fan um, back in the day, but she was converted via David Copperfield. So um, yes, I also think it is one of his best. So it was a good one to start back with. If you're looking for a good Victorian novel and you know, it's cold outside or whatever, and you're like, do you know what I'd like to do? Get stuck into a classic then I would highly recommend David Copperfield. Next we have Underland, which I feel like um, fell a bit under the radar for me, uh, even though I really, really loved it. I read it on my Kindle, I think I read it over the course of a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. So um, I, sort of <laughs> I sort of forget about it, but it's so, so good. Um, it is a non-fiction, it's about Underlands. Um, Robert McFarlane is a nature writer. Um, I would like to read more Macfarlane this year. And Macfarlane has a really beautiful way of writing, it's very gentle, it brings you on a journey. You know, a lot of us are not travelling at the minute, not going anywhere, sitting at home all the time. I would highly recommend this book for right now because it will bring you places, new places. I loved his combination of sort of science-y elements, literary elements, um, so he gives a really nice well-rounded view of the nature that he's writing about. We have another, Jeff Vandermeer in Bourne, and this book is just as weird, if not weirder, than the Southern Reeves trilogy. And this one is about a post-apocalyptic city, which is ruled over, sort of, by this enormous bioengineered flying bear. <laughs> which, when you say that, sounds ridiculous. Um, and there's all sorts going on in here. So the protagonist finds this strange, sea creaturely looking thing in the bear's fur, um, because people kind of scavenge on the bear because he picks up stuff around the city. And she raises this weird creature and chaos happens. <laughs> um, so again, it's about personhood. It's about human and non-human life. It's about bioengineering. It's just fantastic. And I would highly recommend it. I would, if you were gonna start with Vandermeer, I would start with Annihilation maybe, or City of Saints and Mad Men as well. Um, and then work your way <laughs> through to the likes of Bourne. We've also got the book of Cain and Margaret, and a rather beautiful book as well. Um, it's about Cain and Margaret, who are two people living in a World War II Japanese relocation camp. And basically each chapter in this has Cain and Margaret in different iterations, different timelines. Uh, we've got Cain and Margaret as an old couple who've been married for years. We've got Cain and Margaret who are a courting young couple. We've got ones where they're athletes or musicians or all sorts of different things. So it's quite an interesting book. It's interesting formally, stylistically. It's interesting in terms of what it's doing there with its protagonist. And each, each chapter seems to challenge the concept of the internment camp and break boundaries and do interesting things. Also does a lot with Japanese folklore, I think. So yes, and it's really beautifully written, um, paired back. It's another nice little book to dip in and out of, so if you're struggling concentration-wise, the chapters are quite short. Next we have This Mournable Body by Titsi Dangorenga. As you will know, if you watched any of my videos at the end of last year, this was my pick for the Booker Prize winner. Sadly it did not win, <laughs> but this would have been my pick. Um, it is the concluding novel in a trilogy that Dangaremka has been writing for many, many decades. And like I said in my previous videos, I do think um, reading the whole trilogy is probably beneficial in order to get the most out of this book. This being probably my favourite out of the three though. It's excellent thematically, it's excellent um, stylistically in its writing, a wonderful character study and is saying a lot of important things about Zimbabwe which is where um, Dan Gremka's from so I would highly highly recommend this one. Again I've talked about it a lot fairly recently so I won't go on about it too much but I certainly will not be forgetting that trilogy anytime soon. Here's another kind of lovely surprise book that I wasn't expecting to like as much as I did which is Vita Nostra by um, Marina and Sergei Tchachenko. Sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation there. And I particularly love this one because it creates a really unique ma magic system. Don't love the term magic system, but 
creates a really unique magic system um, that is very metaphysical, it's very philosophical, um, it's very clever, and I just loved it wrapped in a sort of fantasy package. I listened to this one, but I would like to reread it. I think it won't be for everyone because it's got quite a sort of removed, detached style, but the ideas are great, and I personally didn't find that at all. I still sort of connected to Sasha and found the story interesting. Next up, we've got a classic, which is James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. I had a very visceral reaction to this book. I found it very moving, and I have really distinct memories of reading it. You know, when you sort of remember exactly where you were and what you were doing. It's a semi-autobiographical book about a young boy um, growing up in 1930s Harlem. His dad is a preacher, and he's struggling with that relationship. He's struggling with his relationship to the church and spirituality. And it all comes to this very sort of poignant, climactic moment. It's beautifully written. I can see why Baldwin is the beloved um, author that he is. And I would highly, highly recommend this one. Um, we've also got The Other Wind by Ursula Le Guin. Um, this is the final Earthsea novel. And I loved the Earthsea book so much. It's my favourite of her sort of worlds that I've come across so far, the Earthsea cycle. And this was the final book, and I think it just brought together all the things I most love about Le Guin. It was gentle, it was beautiful, I love the characters, I love the plotline, I love the sort of underlying themes and ideologies, and a wonderful conclusion to the cycle. So I will definitely be rereading Earthsea at some point, because I just loved it so much. Finally, a book I don't actually have, I haven't bought a physical copy yet, but I will, and that's Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire by Akala, um, another non-fiction book. This one is, unsurprisingly, about how the legacy of the British Empire and the British Empire still affect um, issues of race and class in the UK today. There's a little bit of autobiographical material from Akala, which marries beautifully well with the historical facts. He covers a lot of stuff um, all across the diaspora. It's really informative, really like interesting, compelling. The writing is great. Um, I listened to it and I wanted to keep listening to it. Um, he reads the audiobook as well and it's just really, really good. So I would recommend the audiobook. But yeah, it's just so good. And I think if you're British, it is a sort of must read um, just to learn so much about why and how our country functions as, as it does. Even if you feel like you have a fair amount of background knowledge about that, I still think there's things to learn from that book. Um, because he covers so much stuff. So yes, highly recommend that one to everyone, but particularly Brits. Okay, my next sort of category, as it were, is um, for the sheer achievement, fascinating, layered and ambitious are the big ideas. So these are the books that are sort of more tricky maybe, but I couldn't do a top books without them because they sort of challenged me in various ways. But anyway, so first of all, we've got Duck's Newbury Port. This is a bit of a controversial one. It's 900 pages of kind of stream of consciousness. It's not exactly stream of consciousness. It's not not stream of consciousness. Quite an interesting thing to think about when reading this book. But anyway, um, of an Ohio housewife who is looking after her kids, getting on with daily life, and at the same time, cripplingly worrying about everything that's going on in the world in a sort of familiar way, in the way that we do these days. But also, it's not super generalised. There are things that make this character very specific and um, differentiating between those things can be quite an interesting way to read this book as well. There are eddies of thought, patterns, clues in this book as to what's really going on here with this woman um, and I think that's the bit that interested me the most particularly as you get into those last couple hundred pages you're really picking up on those things it's a difficult book it is at times excruciating <laughs> um, it's mundane it's boring but I think it's quite the achievement actually I swung back and forth between loving it hating it I think there's actually a lot going on in here even though it seems like it, it's just endless lists of stuff if you're looking to challenge yourself with a contemporary read, I would recommend it. Um, next up, for some reason I don't have it with me, but, but next up we've got The Way by Swans, 
or as it's more commonly known, uh, Swan's Way by Marcel Proust. It's the first volume in his renowned work In Search of Lost Time. So it's a literary classic and I can see the book's influence in so much of what we read today, which almost makes it worth reading by itself. But um, I love this, I love the way Proust tries to pin down our thought processes, how we think and why we think. It's not a perfect book for me, but I think there's so much going on in the way that it's written that it is worth reading. I've been trying to make my way through In Search of Lost Time, I will continue with that this year. I have read the second volume, which I liked much, much less. Um, this one I particularly liked, it focuses on the protagonist's childhood, involuntary memory, and yeah, growing up, coming of age, that sort of thing. I really, really liked how Proust just tries to map some of the ways that we think um, in literature. It's so hard to do, and I think he makes a pretty good stab at it. Couldn't do this video without that one. Um, and the other book that is in this category, which I don't think I have either, is um, Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. You may remember me saying that this book really surprised me in lots of ways. It goes places you sort of don't expect at all. It starts off with a couple called Rachel and Eliza who are trying to decide whether to have a baby. And at the same time, Rachel seems to be experiencing some sort of weird happening where she thinks ants are like invading her brain. And then the subsequent chapters sort of seem maybe related, but maybe not related, embarking on different storylines. And it all comes together in this crazy sort of mishmash of things. I just loved Sophie Ward's ambition in this novel, the scope of her vision, and yes, for that reason, I would recommend it. Um, so now we've got the best of the rest. Um, so for whatever reason, these ones, when I look at my list of books from this year, do stand out to me. So let's go through them. So first up, we've got Richard Wright's Native Son. Um, and thank you to the lovely Hina, bookish babe, for recommending this one. Otherwise, I don't think I would have picked it up. So my camera stopped recording and didn't tell me. If you ever wonder why I'm looking at myself in the screen, um, it's because this sort of thing happens and I speed through another four books and I have to repeat myself. But anyway, I think I was somewhere talking about Native Son. So it was published in 1940. It's about a young black man called Bigger Thomas. He's living in poverty in um, Chicago and he's just sort of trapped in this sort of cycle of violence and suffering um, that poverty and racism brings upon him. And he ends up committing some pretty heinous crimes um, as a result. But the sort of point of the book, by the time you get to the end of it, is to show how He's trapped in that cycle, basically, that he sort of reflects um, the contempt that society shows him. He reflects that back in his actions. So it's kind of a controversial book. Baldwin really didn't like it, James Baldwin. Um, and I talk about that a little bit in my original review. It is explained quite well in the introduction to this book. So it's not always worth reading the introduction, but in this case, it definitely is. I think it provides some really interesting context for this book. But it's not just interesting thematically um, and for what it sort of thinks about and talks about, but also the writing is really um, pacey in this. It really draws you along. There's a lot of te narrative tension. It kind of goes at a galloping pace, um, which is something that I find quite rare in books of this era. Um, and I really, really enjoy it. So Wright is also an excellent author as well. Um, stylistically. I would definitely like to read more right at some point as well. Next we've got White is for Witching by Helena Yamey. This is probably my favourite book that I read in October, my kind of creepy Halloween um, reading. Uh, it's about a haunted house kind of in Dover um, but it's very layered, lyrical, beautiful, unsettling, weird. It's about all sorts of things um, xenophobia, immigration, borders, borderlands. Um, it's also about gender and family um, and all sorts of things. And it's just really, really well done. Really beautiful writing, some very complex themes in quite a short little page count. And it's got that unsettling um, vibe as well, which I like. I almost forgot I read 
Girl, Woman, Other this year by Bernadine Evaristo. I read it way, way, way back in January, which feels like a lifetime ago and a different world ago. But I remember there being lots to like about this. I know I was sort of talking about how I get caught up sometimes in trendy books and new books and books that are talked about a lot. And a lot of them don't quite live up to my expectations, but this is an exception to that. And I think it deserves all the hype that it got um, when it first came out. And it won the Booker Prize. Unfortunately, it won along with an Atwood novel, but we won't talk about that. Um, so this is about 12 women, well, I think it's 11 women and one non-binary character who are black British. And it's just about the sheer scope of their lives, different experiences. Every story really touches on loads and loads of stuff in here, quite with a quite light um, touch, but it's very masterful. Um, I remember really liking the style of this. It's got a kind of a run-on sentence style, um, third person sort of free and direct style, which I thought worked really, really well, allowed the readers to sort of gently critique each of the characters, look at the differences between them, the similarities, iterations of race and class. Um, yes. And I think she really captures something of life in this book and I would highly recommend it. One of those hyped books that is worth the hype in my opinion. Final book on the list um, and another audiobook and another book that I don't have physically yet is My Name Is Why by Lem Say. I listened to it not long ago um, and really liked it. Um, it's a really beautiful memoir. Um, Lem Say is a best known for being a poet I think but he's also just in general in the literary world um, and he is reflecting on his childhood as a black boy growing up in care in the 70s in the north of England and he sort of juxtaposes his own sort of thoughts and feelings and his own experiences um, which are very beautifully written he is a poet after all um, with the sort of dry documentation surrounding his life um, by his social workers and various other sort of people in his world um, and it's very moving, thought-provoking, heart-wrenching um, and I would highly recommend it as an audiobook experience as well and yes definitely my favourite memoir that I read this year don't typically get on that well with memoir but I thought this was really well written, well put together, focused and you know had something really important to say so yes, that is all of my top 2020 books. I do have some honourable mentions, which I'm not going to go into, but I'll list them. Um, Rosewater by Tade Thompson, which you haven't heard me speak about yet because I read it in December. Um, Between the World and Me by ta Coates. That Reminds Me by Derek Owusu. I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. Early Warning by Jane Smiley, which is that middle book in the Smiley trilogy that I read this year. Stardust by Neil Gaiman and The Word for World is Forest by Ursula K. Le Guin. All of those are my honourable mentions, <laughs> I'm not going to go into them. Um, I will link up all my original reviews down below if you want to have a look. But that is everything, my loves. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope for those of you who did not um, make the way through all my very lengthy book videos this year, for which I do not blame you, um, found some good recommendations. And I'm so excited for my new reading year. But yes, I will see you all again very soon. Bye.